rolled steel section windows have been an area that's become increasingly important in the preservation field in the last 20 years. Younger people coming into the field now are going to find that they're going to be continually charged with dealing with them. The genesis of steel windows is most pronounced in the latter part of the 19th century. They played well to the architecture that was also growing out of the late 19th century and certainly most pronounced uh, after World War I. The fact that the large expanses of glass, uh, ribbon windows, the massive sizes of the windows, uh, which were intended to admit large amounts of daylighting and ventilation. It was able to be addressed with the uh, incorporation of uh, steel technologies simply by virtue of a relatively small section of, of window framing element spanning a relatively large distance. I really feel that while we, um, we so often associate rolled steel section windows with industrial buildings, that one of the most significant uh, aesthetic uses is with prominent residences in the 1920s. And I think this is an area where uh, we really need to pay greater attention because I think these window systems are in danger. Steel windows from a residential perspective were popular uh, because of the aesthetic, kind of an industrial type aesthetic used more commonly during the Art Deco times of the 1920s. I suspect they fell out of popularity because of issues with uh, frosting and issues with the performance of the windows themselves in time. The problems are all going to be similar. Basically, you're going to have rusting on the bottom frame members, rusting on the subframe members. You'll undoubtedly have hardware problems, and the hardware problems will differ a lot depending upon the amount that the windows have been used. When we evaluate any facade component, including windows, we start at a global level and we work down toward the micro levels. Looking at the windows as a whole, their general condition, um, how they work, how they function, um, how they're integrated into the wall system. Uh, the conditions themselves are a function of looking at them in greater detail. Oftentimes in the evaluation of steel windows, what we ideally like to do actually in the evaluation of any type of window is to disassemble them so that we're able to look at the components which may be concealed from view to determine the extent of deterioration and potentially what is necessary for a restoration. With steel windows, one of the most common types of distress is at, at the at basic level, it's deterioration of the coatings. Often what has been done and is done is the existing coatings are overcoated with a new coating and over time, particularly with buildings and steel windows which are now approaching 100 years old, they could have multiple layers of paint on them which begin to affect their performance. At a more systemic level, it's deterioration and corrosion of the steel components. Uh, the first thing we do is uh, take a look at the windows and take a very good look at the scope that the designer has uh, put together and make sure that uh, the work is covered and it's uh, stuff we understand. It's so much easier to, um, to get the full scope of the work covered if, if the documentation and the, and the original documents are, um, all the aspects are there. We have a full window schedule. Does the window schedule have all the measurements? Does the window schedule have the scopes? Um, is there a types page for the window schedule? And that's, that's my biggest pet peeve if I had one. The project split into uh, two parts. Basically, we have uh, on-site work and we also have uh, in-shot work. So the windows start from being removed from site by our contractors and brought over to our uh, shop for restoration. And that's when we actually begin the process of, of blasting, painting, abatement, many different trades that we have going on in our shop. Our processes here are maintaining all the different contractors to make sure that windows before shipment all the processes are corrected prior to arriving on site. A lot of it is organizing and sequencing what needs to be done before other things. So there's film and coating thicknesses, there's blast film checking, hardware assembly, and glazing. So each bay of windows is assigned its own numerical value um, for, for that specific bay number. Uh, it's unique to only that bay. And then each window is assigned a letter value within that bay. So once we receive the window, we break it down and separate its components. Uh, windows typically have between five and uh, 12 components, 
and each specific component is tagged according to that window. Once the window is tagged and all the components are breaking down and tags as well, uh, we put it into a rack where that corresponding tag matches the rack tag. And once all the components are in there, we keep everything organized. And it's very important to keep everything in that specific area because once again, each window size is different and it's really important that we put the uh, specific window right back where it belongs. One of the, one of the big reasons that tagging and the, the whole uh, tagging process for any kind of a steel window job is very important is because steel windows and steel components and steel metal parts are very unforgiving. Two windows might be the same type, the same size, and the, and the glazing stops might be the same type and same size. You think they're interchangeable, they are not. So um, typically if you get a, a, a thread for a screw hole be off by a 64th of an inch, that screw is not going into the, into the hole. Um, so typically the different parts of the window that get broken down are uh, the sash and the frame. Uh, typically there are some uh, hardware pieces on the frame that need to be removed. Um, all the threads on every single thing need to be chased out with a, with a tap uh, to make sure that they're all clean. The first step would be uh, abatement, which means we take all the asbestos containing materials uh, and scrape that away from the window. We do that in our specific asbestos containment uh, and then we pass the window on to blasting. The asbestos um, process is actually one of the more simpler processes in our, um, in our shop. It's just hand tools and they specifically just scrape the edges of all the windows. So with the asbestos removal, all the um, trades who work for that have to have Tyvek suits, uh, a breathing apparatus, and the containment itself is negative air machine. We test for lead regularly and we have an outside firm come come through and test for uh, lead levels in the air. Once the guys bring the window into the containment and do their asbestos removal, once they're completed with that, they have to shower and take off their suits um, before exiting their containment. Uh, once we go into blasting, this is the um, lead paint removal. At that point, the window should be contaminant free and, uh, and safe to work with. Removing of the existing coatings can occur in a couple of different ways. Um, there can be chemical strippers that are used in order to remove the existing coatings. Um, chemical strippers are good because they contain the lead and so disposing of the lead containing paint is, is a much easier process using chemical strippers. The downside of chemical stripping is it's very difficult to remove coatings from the various crevices and um, inside surfaces that exist in any window and doing that uh, can be difficult. The most effective method of removing of coatings is a blasting process. What's important in a blasting process is that you have a media selected that will not damage the steel during the blasting process. If, if a paint system has a, a prescribed tooth level that it needs as, the, as for the substrate, um, there's recommended uh, grits that you can use and different, different blast media that you can use to get down to different levels of that tooth. So if you needed uh, something finer, maybe you'd use a, a finer sand or a sm for a smaller tooth. If you needed something bigger, maybe you're using an iron oxide or something a little bit more gritty. So our uh, blasting professional has his own specific containment. Uh, what we want to do in here is create a dust-free environment um, to keep anything out of bedding between the glass and the uh, blast room itself. Once the window is then blasted, we put it in the zinc priming containment. Um, that's when the paint process begins. We start with the zinc epoxy, an intermediate epoxy, and then a final coat. The reason we use zinc is for corrosion prevention. We coat both sides in one day because it's an eight-hour flash period, uh, uncoated, so uh, we have to make sure we do that in, in one day. We keep each portion of the coating process separate because um, there's all different types of contaminants that, that could that could definitely affect the coating. So once the window is zinced and, and basically uh, rust protected, uh, it moves into the intermediate epoxy, which is the second separate process and also a separate containment. So once the windows are in this containment, the intermediate epoxy process begins. He sprays those, we flip them in there, and typically they can stay in there for the final coating as well. You wanna make sure you have the proper protective equipment doing any coating uh, because any solvent-based material could be dangerous and is dangerous to inhale or breathe any type of vapor. So you want to make sure you have the proper respirator. You want to make sure all your skin is covered, hands, gloves, uh, long sleeve shirt, and uh, a spray sock 
and any exposed skin. Some people even like to apply a bit of Vaseline to make sure uh, nothing is touching your skin. Uh, so all the windows uh, come back with their original glass, most of which is, is heavily damaged or, um, or missing completely. So we've went ahead and uh, replaced all glass on the project with a uh, single pane monolithic glass uh, with blast film um, for solar retention as well as safety. Whenever you're dealing with old glass, um, definitely just research it and make sure that what you're providing as the replacement is a viable option and will look correct for the building. Even if you're in a historic building and the glass looks just like it's regular float glass or it looks like it's you know, something that's commercially available that's you know, cheap and easy to get, might not be. So you have to really look at the color of the glass, the texture of the glass, everything about that glass that makes that building special. It's if you start changing portions of that, that's going to create a problem. It was really difficult to find somebody who would be able to uh, procure all the different sizes for this project with there being so many. The challenges was measuring all this glass and sending it over to somebody and getting different quantities and all that stuff provided for, um, for each window type. We are able to um, get a single pane monolithic glass uh, in the correct size and have them provide all the glass for the entire project. The fresh glass is brought into the clean room, which is then cleaned and sprayed with a solution of soap, water, and a little bit of alcohol. Um, the film applicator cleans and applies water to the glass, which is then the blast film is applied onto that, set into place, and cut to make sure that it fits each one. Um, it's then squeegeed out so that it applies, and then it needs about a 24-hour curing process for all the water to be removed. Um, at that point, after 24 hours, we do a check to see if there's any inclusions, bubbles, scratches, misplaced film, or misaligned film. And getting that done prior to assembly was a key for this project. Once everything's painted, it comes back out, and we start the reassembly process. So all of these uh, pieces that got disassembled, tagged, and went through the restoration process are now coming back together. Everything gets laid out on the table, and you start piecing together the window, inserting the glass. So maybe you're, maybe depending on the setting detail, if you're using some butyl tape maybe in there to hold the glass in, put the stops back on, and then you're doing like a caulk joint on the interior and the exterior of the, of the glass. The end goal here is obviously organization, and it's very important to keep everything together. Each window has its own components in the rack, as well as a glass size specifically tied to that window. So once the window is taken off the rack and put into the glazing containment, everything is already provided for that window. So you'll have the frame, the sash itself, as well as all glazing components, and the glass provided with that window. Typically with the glazing process, we receive the windows after paint and bring them into our glazing containment. We use about a quarter inch uh, glazing tape, which is put around the edges of the window. And then the glass specific to that window size is set into the glazing pocket. On the other side, we use metal glass glazing stops. With the glazing process, it's really important that we have a neat and clean edge. Uh, it's not only for looks, but it also helps with uh, water distribution and keeping uh, rust off of the windows. So the most important part of the quality control is definitely the final check checking every window right before packaging, going through all of our previous checks, making sure that all the corrections were made, making sure that all the hardware is functional, assembled on and in the right spot. Also, there's a, a final clean prior to packaging, but a lot of these processes needed to be done in line upstream. Once it's been determined that the window is good for on-site shipping, we then begin to wrap all of the windows in foam, tape the windows up, and make sure to put that specific window number and bay number on the outside so our on-site professionals know where exactly this window goes. What's very important in the reinstallation process is minimizing the damage that is going to be done to the windows that requires touch-up. Some damage is inevitable. That's part of the process of reviewing the windows once they have been reinstalled. So once the window is brought over to the site, uh, my on-site team will organize it according to the window number and the bay number. So they remove the window from the trailer, cart it over to that specific bay, and unwrap the window. Um, once the window is unwrapped, they can begin to uh, start the installation process. Uh, they attach the frame to a hoist system and bring it up to that specific opening, put the window in place. Before they put it in place, they want to caulk the interior pocket to create another weather seal. 
the window is then pushed into this glaze and all mechanical components are then fastened into place for brick molds and any of the original pieces that were holding this window in place as well. So in terms of maintaining a window once it has been restored, certainly looking at the window at a cursory level on a regular basis every few months, every year, certainly at the most, um, in terms of understanding um, if it's functioning properly, if there are issues with it. In terms of post-occupancy evaluation of restored windows or dealing with clients after steel windows have been restored, there's a need to manage expectations so that they understand that even a restored steel window is not going to perform as well as a new modern window in terms of being potentially drafty, having cold surfaces on it, and even condensation forming on the glass and the frame itself. The greatest lesson learned in the ongoing restoration of historic steel windows, these are durable elements that people readily fall in love with that will perform many, many, many years, decades, even generations into the future. And that's why we're here. That's what we live for.